it was practically a one-man show because towards the very end, this other character comes in, but it was me on the stage for like 45 minutes. And every night I was like, tonight's the night I'm gonna have a panic attack in front of a thousand people. Oh. I was lucky enough to sit down with the Tony Hale, two-time Emmy Award winner, known for his roles in Arrested Development, Veep. We talk about working with really awful people in Hollywood, his anxiety, his really strong connection with asthma and how he is now advocating for finding a cure for the illness. I really enjoyed this conversation. I hope you do as well. Let's get started. Be whoop. Well, thank you so much for joining. Thank you for having me. Huge fan. Oh, that's nice. No, but seriously, because for me, I started watching Veep late. Mm. And when I started watching, your character is the character that I related to most. Oh, yeah. Great. And so I was the character like- I related to most. Yeah. And I've heard you talk about on other podcasts how you feel like your life experience got you ready for that role. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I would say not just that role. I would say Arrested Development. I mean, I- I mentioned this on another podcast, but when I booked Arrested Development, I was so overwhelmed by the business. I had never been on a studio a lot. I was so overwhelmed and thank God I was playing a character that was completely disassociated <laughs> and just overwhelmed by everything. And I remember just needing safe spaces when I came to the business in LA and just being like, I don't, I don't feel grounded and Buster was never felt safe. And, and then with Gary, he just, you know, I think just in life, I deal with people pleasing and um, feeling feelings that are not my responsibility, um, classic codependent stuff. And it's like, that's all Gary was, which is, I think is a really cool thing how God, not to be spiritual about it, but I think how God can use kind of suffering that we go through for good. And it's like a lot of stuff, anxiety, you know, people pleasing, whatever I dealt with in life, I can bring it in an authentic way in these characters and also through comedy. Do you look into the subject of post-traumatic growth ever? Or have you ever heard the term? No, but I, whatever you're saying, <laughs> I, I'm already in. <laughs> I'm like down. Well, we hear the term PTSD yeah. very often and it's yeah, important yeah, yeah. to talk about sure, sure, people sure. really struggle with yeah. issues related to their traumas. And we see that actually far past PTSD. We see adverse childhood events impact us in our adult lives in mm. ways that we don't even comprehend yet. Mm. When I say we, meaning the medical community doesn't comprehend yet. Yeah. Because there's been great research and books written, like the body keeps the score yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, of how these traumas affect us going on in life. But they're, on the flip side, which I think should be talked about more often, is how traumas impact us in a way that we grow Mm -hmm. And we bring benefit to the world, which is exactly what you're talking about. Oh, yeah. When you're talking about the struggles that you've had yeah. and how that can potentially help others down the line. Yeah. I was just watching, uh, I'm sure you've seen Jonah uh, Hill's mm -hmm. show with his therapist. Yes, that's. And how he said, you know, pain, uncertainty, and constant work is always a part of life. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, the challenge, it's always going to be a part of life, but the crossroads of can you use that to, benefit yourself and benefit others rather than let it eat you alive. Essentially as an artist, isn't that what you're always trying yeah. to channel? Yeah, totally. I mean, and, it's, and I have to be, in, in all honesty, there are things that I have not done because it's just a little, I mean, I remember years ago I was offered this role who was, he was a dentist and he, he had like, he was like a serial rapist. It was just really dark. And I was like, yeah, I just, <laughs> I don't want to like, I don't want to, that's just, I, it's, I, it's hard. I can, it's, I don't mind playing like evil or something like that, but there's certain things it's I, at this point, I just didn't want to go into that world. Mm -hmm. You know, do you think that there's truth in that? If you play an evil role, it starts taking a, an impact on your life in real life. I, I've mm -hmm. heard, uh, they talk about, uh, the, the Joker role. Oh, uh, and how that impacted him. And I think, you, I mean, you, the fact is you have to open yourself up I remember years ago I was I did this role on Law and Order and I and the character was um, his daughter was kidnapped mm -hmm. and my daughter was five years old at the time and so you have to kind of emotionally dive into the impossible you know and just be like what would that be like to in order to get the authenticity and the performance and so I can see you know ex, you know especially like some of these really um, like really dark dark stuff. I don't, not necessarily the Joker. I mean, that is, that, that is dealing with a lot of mental illness, but I mean, like kind of into the, 
criminal aspect. Criminal, but like horror stuff and like mystical stuff. And I don't know, just like the dark, almost demonic stuff. It's like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I just don't want to, I don't want to like open that door at all. Cause I think mm -hmm. there is, obviously we know there's evil in the world. And it's just like stuff like that. I'm like, I, I think you got to be a little careful with that. Sure. So yeah. you, you focus on protecting yourself. I think, yes, but it's also with that said, I think, I mean, I've, the character I play on Mysterious Benedict Society, he's incredibly manipulative. He's, he's, a, he's, he's been traumatized in his life. He hurts people because he's been hurt, all this kind of stuff. And the fact is, in order to, one thing I learned years ago, I did this movie that was just not a good movie. I won't even say what the movie was, but <laughs> I was playing this guy who was like really manipulative and he was kind of entitled and all this kind of stuff. And you, and I remember going to this acting coach and being like, ugh, I don't like these people. I don't mm. like this character I'm playing. I don't even like to be around this kind of a character. And she said to me something I've never forgotten. This is a typical actor lesson. She said, you have to find those characteristics within yourself in order to play it authentically. Wow. And the fact is that's absolutely true because if I'm honest, I have been manipulative in my day. I've had moments of entitlement. I've been a bit of a player. I'm not proud of it, but I've, I've had moments of that in my life. And you have to resonate with those characteristics because the moment you bring them out of yourself rather than playing an idea of the character, that's when the authenticity comes out. So even something incredibly dark, you have to find points of resonance in that character in order to bring out the authenticity. And then do you feel like by pointing out those instances, they can magnify those traits in you? Um, I think when you are doing that, this sounds very kind of artsy fartsy, but I do think some people think, oh, I'm okay, I can just brush it off. I think you gotta ground yourself in reality. You gotta ground yourself in your family. You gotta stay true to your community. Um, Cause there, when like, this is a very small example, but when I was playing Buster, I was in such a hypersensitive neurotic space all day. I remember coming home and my wife asked me something and I was like, ew, like I was so wow. reactive. You know, cause I'm, I was just always in this state of defense. And she was like, all right, let's, <laughs> let's just, let's take a deep breath. And I never, I never consider myself a method actor. I don't consider myself, I consider myself pretty, I can easily, I'm okay. okay I can try to stay boundaries stuff. But when you're in something, when you're reacting at such a heightened state all day long and you're, you're, we don't use every emotion in life all the time where yeah. you're like crying and you're reactive. You just can't expect yourself just to do, go home and be like, hey, wow. what's dinner, what's on? You know, it's like you have to, you got to breathe and kind of take care of yourself. It, that's not surprising that you say that from a medical aspect. Yeah. Because when we do functional MRIs where we actually see how blood flow changes in our brains yeah. and we, let's say, know the patterns that emerge when you're scared yeah, yeah. or when you're running. Yeah. When we see people in movies running, yeah. the same areas light up. But now I can only imagine as an actor playing a role, yeah. how much more realistic is it for yeah. your brain that you're actually turning into this and experiencing those things? Yeah, and I would say kind of like emotionally, if I'm having to, like with my daughter being kidnapped, like really put myself into that, um, there's you can't escape that your body is, your body's thinking, what the hell? Like you're emoting in a way that is, oh, it's real, so it's gonna react that way. But if I, say if I am doing something that where I may be scared, I'm, I've read the script, so I'm aware that something, so I, I can act, but I guess you, I could say I could do the same thing with my daughter leaving, but there's something, I, I guess what I'm getting at is there is a bit of a detachment that does happen with performance that for me doesn't necessarily happen when I'm watching something. So Interesting. If, like, I do not like to watch horror. I do not like to watch very scary things because... I'll watch CNN and be just as freaked out. You know, <laughs> well, these I'll, days I'll be home and wonder, you know, what's around the corner. I mean, I, I fear-based living is already somewhat some. I would say more of a default for me. I have to work on being present. I have to work on being. It's it's very easy to go to the anxious fear space. So watching a movie where someone's jumping out at me, I mean, because my wife's like, "You're an actor. Why can't you like no, detach that from that?" Yeah. And I'm like. I just, there's something about my body. I just, it freaks me out too much. I would be watching The Office and it was so <laughs> awkward. I don't mind playing awkward, but like watching it, I'm like, Steve Carell was so awful. I was just like, there's a part of it's like, 
how does he still have a job? Why, <laughs> why, why do they, why is this guy still hired? Like what's going on? And I would have to, it would get so awkward. I would just leave the room. My wife is like, you do awkward comedy for a living. And I'm like, something I, when I watch it, I just can't It's like full it. buy-in. Yeah. It's so bizarre. Wow. Um, do you view that as a positive or negative? I, I would say, I would say as an actor, probably a positive because I think I can engage emotionally in things maybe that, you know, someone else might not be able to. And then what about as a human? I struggle with um, uh, not taking on someone else's feelings. Mm. So it's like I, I've worked at post a lot of therapy uh, listening and not um, feeling like I have to take on an issue that is not my responsibility to take on. Wow. That's very powerful, especially if you were going into the medical field. Oh, dude. Because, or a therapist. Yeah, I mean, exactly. it's, it's just like, I cannot even imagine what you guys go through. Now, as a listener, or even you, like as an empath or something where like I, I'm engaged, but you know, it takes a lot of work to be there and be present and not feel the need to fix the situation or take care of that person. Yeah, and mental health is a little bit different than medical health in yeah. this regard. Yeah. Where sometimes you need to be present, listen without taking action. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you need to be present and help and take action. Yeah. And knowing the distinction between the two is truly what makes a good clinician. And that's so tricky. And it probably, I would think, takes a lot of practice. Yeah. Because I'm sure there have been times where you've, it's been hard to shake that coming home. Yeah. You know? Well, because when you're in school, you read a textbook and a textbook is the furthest thing from a human. The textbook yeah, says, if yeah, a person yeah. is experiencing feeling A, yeah. do treatment B. And no human comes in and says, well, I have feeling A. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, can yeah, I get yeah. treatment B? It's a lot more Ooh. complex and interwined. And also with children. Oh yeah. Like, Adolescents going through puberty. Oh man, that would be really, really hard. My, my uh, niece works is a on the um uh, she, on the cancer she's a nurse in the cancer mm -hmm. department uh, ward i guess oncology ward oncology ward and um i just have such admiration for what she does um and the process that she has to go through to just not disengage but to separate the two yeah because moral injury which is a term that yeah. one of my colleagues Ooh, wow. use in in medicine what cuz we're seeing record rates of suicide in medicine oh. and oh, people just quitting the field. Yeah, You go in wanting to help people mm -hmm. with a lot of virtue. Mm -hmm. And then the system kind of breaks you down and you realize your 15 minutes with a patient that really is 10 minutes because of them getting roomed and all that mm -hmm. is never enough to accomplish what you set out to accomplish. Yeah, yeah. And then you're forced to take shortcuts and then insurance companies destroy you and give you administrative hurdles. And then you lose sight of the goal. So I'm curious if you've ever heard from her that she's struggling with that these days. Um, she, I don't, we have talked about it. She's pretty, she's, she, she maybe we're working for about five years. So mm -hmm. I think it's, she's, she's pretty young, but um, I think we have talked about it. And there's obviously times where she has to go in the back room and cry and kind of like, but um, I mean, it's a good encouragement to talk about it with her again. Cause yeah. it's that whole, I'm sure the term, like compassion fatigue. Oh yeah. Yeah. For sure. It's, uh, there's a, um, I know, uh, like I have friends who are missionaries mm. and they, it's such a real thing where it's like, it is so depleting and, and, but also the self care aspect of it is not encouraged enough. Yeah. Um, and it's actually in our society kind of seen as a weakness, obviously. Yeah. So to work on that as, is, is sometimes is sometimes harder than to work on the compassion. Well, that's why traditionally all medical people are really bad patients themselves. Yeah. Cuz they don't take care of themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, myself included. I'm, sure. I'd probably be the worst patient <laughs> if I was hospitalized for And also just like you know what they're doing. Yeah. I mean, it's a classic thing of going to a therapist and if somebody asks like I know the question you're asking. Yeah. You know, it's like my choice is do I give the right answer or do I give the answer you want to hear and all that yeah, kind of stuff, yeah, you know. Yeah. That's really tough. I actually had a, an experience when I was uh, in medical school myself. I lost my mom to cancer while oh, I was in medical school. I'm so sorry. Thank you. And I had to be the one that asked the residents to stop doing chest compressions to try and attempt to bring her back because it was far gone. And there was limited oh. benefit at that point. 
And we were waiting to fill you, out. So you were with you were with her when she yes, oh, like the whole the whole so process, sorry. and witnessing that, and then waiting to fill out papers, mm. death certificates, all these things with my father. Um, we had to wait a long period of time. So I went to go check in with the nursing staff why it's taking so long. Can we speed up the process anyway? And they're all laughing and having a good time in, in their back room. Mm. And it created a learning moment, mm. an anger moment, and an understanding moment, mm. like a growth moment at all at the same time. Mm. Because you witness people who need that break because mm. they're, th this is, that was in, um, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital, which is a cancer mm -hmm. hospital in mm -hmm. New York. Mm -hmm. So they're experiencing death in the ICU quite often. Mm. So they can't be the bearers mm. of everyone's pain all mm. the time because they can't last. Mm -hmm. So they need to have fun. In the, but hearing that laugh is the last thing you want to hear. Of course. So what I took away from that was I can't judge them for it because yeah. they need their, their time. They're doing it in the back. It's appropriate. Yeah. And then when I was a resident, and I was working in the ICU and I saw my fellow residents laugh somewhere in the vicinity of families that I told them how I felt and I, not in a yeah, derogatory course, way, course, but just sharing my journey. And it created a really good learning yeah, opportunity yeah, yeah. from such a dark time because you, you gotta have that space, but you gotta have the respect and yes. balancing it all is so tricky. And you really can when you're in the middle of it, I would think just yeah. easily forget that. Sure. That reminded me, my, my wife lost her brother, uh, a long, uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, 22 years ago. And sh that feeling of she remembers waking up the next day and just everything life is, every, for everybody else's life is going on as normal. Yep. And there's that odd, like, don't you know yes. what's just happened to me? Like that everybody with loss goes through that. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's a hard moment. That's why um, I, I think as a person, if you as a medical professional could be more of a human and experience things, the mm -hmm. more value you could bring to your patients. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you talk a lot about in previous interviews mm -hmm. about how your anxiety mm -hmm. and things that you worry in your everyday life have impacted your work, mm -hmm. your, your personal life. Mm -hmm. Can you share a little bit about how that journey of mm -hmm. living with anxiety and that sort of fear that you talk about that even gets yeah. brought up when you watch a horror movie or a scary, scary movie. Yeah. I, so I've, I mean, I've dealt with anxiety for as long as I can remember, I think. And I would say the, I mean, it's, I think it's obviously a very mixed bag being an artist or an actor where those are your tools but I think it got to a point in my life where I be I felt like I was a I was a victim to my thoughts and my feelings, where they were every thought was so overwhelming, every feeling was so overwhelming, and I identified with every thought and every mm -hmm. feeling. And I just felt like I was drowning. I was like, I can't. This is probably I would say this is probably like 12 years ago. And I just kind of I hit a real wall. Um and I started to go to this therapist who did uh cognitive behavioral therapy. And this whole concept of just um, being more of an observer of your thoughts and your feelings rather than identifying with every single one was just something I had not thought about. And he really picked, he really kind of put it in language that I think was so intelligent that he, in language that I would know, he would say, it's like you're watching your feelings and emotions on a movie screen. And um, even as I just said that I identify too much with movies and TVs, <laughs> but, um, or he would even say, it's like you're watching your thoughts and your feelings like cars on a highway. And you would just say, um, like if I had a, if I had a thought that my da real daughter was going to get kidnapped or something like that, I, I used to just be like, Oh gosh, well, I would go into this just narrative. And what if narrative in my body would start to react? Like how would I react and all this kind of stuff. And he's like, you know what, let's start going like, Oh yeah, there's that, there's that thought. Um, and you just, and, and there it goes. Oh, and there's that feeling. And I, and, and two years ago I did this play, um, called wakey wakey and, and in San Francisco. And it was practically a one man show because towards the very end, this other character comes in, but it was me on the stage for like 45 minutes. And every night I was like, tonight's the night I'm going to have a panic attack in front of a thousand people. Oh. And I just every single night. And I remember us talking to the therapist about this. And I also remember Bill Hader talking about his anxiety like this, but when those anxious feelings came up, something I never, ever did, and I'm just so grateful that I've had the opportunity to learn this. 
but I never did this. And when those anxious feelings come up and be like, you're going to have a panic attack, you're going to lose your shit. You know, this is all going down, all this kind of stuff. What I used to do is say, okay, I got this. Let's go. And he says, let's turn to that voice and say, Hey, I really appreciate you being here. I know you're trying to protect me and I'm, I really thank you for it. I'm going to go do the play. I'll be back, but I want to tell you that I really appreciate you being here because I know you're trying to help me. And I did that every night and it just took the air out of the balloon and it dissipated that anxiety because I've never faced my anxiety with compassion. Mm. I've only faced it with like trying to cut off a limb of my body. Yeah. And just being like, God, just keep going, keep going. And there is some, there is some validity to keep walking sure. by far. Like there's this, there is this female, um, uh, there's this, uh, preacher named Joyce Myers and, I'll never forget, she was saying, you know, many times we always think we gotta be in a place of peace and joy to like take a step or strength. And she's like, no, many times you are scared to death. And she said, you just gotta do it afraid, do it afraid. And so there is a lot of validity that like, you know what, whatever you're feeling, just keep walking. But there's a lot of also giving compassion to those feelings that I was not doing for yeah. years, you know? I think it's the difference between the short-term fear and the long-term approaches you have to the fear. Yeah. So in the moment, maybe it's worth taking that step and then building the motivation yeah, yeah, of yeah. taking that first step. Yeah. But then long-term you have to give yourself compassion. Otherwise that's where burnout comes from. Yeah, totally. And there, it's just a, and crazy ass thoughts and feelings come through our body. Mm -hmm. our head. I mean, it's crazy. And, and, and you can't, it's, it's, it's also the thing. I think it was Chelsea Handler saying once I was listening to someone, she said, you know, just because you have jealous feelings, that doesn't mean you're a jealous person. Mm -hmm. And it's, I just think stuff like that is so powerful because like, if I'm have these feelings, it's like, Oh God, who am I to feel like that? Who am I to think that it's just a feeling? Yeah. It's just a thought that doesn't identify who you are. It's just that those things come and go. They're not who you are. And this is, uh, I'm very uh, pro evidence-based medicine. Yeah. So meaning like everything we recommend has to be with some kind of level of proof of why yeah, we yeah. recommend it. Um, which is why I'm so against a lot of these miracle cure-all potions, supplements, mm. all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's evidence-based approaches to mental health where mm. if we have a patient coming in and we ask them about, have you ever had thoughts of harming yourself or others? Mm. As a medical student, at times you're afraid to ask that question because you say, what if I'm implanting that thought in their head? Mm. When the evidence shows the opposite. By asking the question, you're decreasing the likelihood that that person will not just think about it, but mm. will go through with it because you're now creating some strategies, some mitigation strategies. You're also bringing it into light, man. Yeah. Like it, isolation, that's when it's going to fester and blow yeah. up. You're bringing it out there. There's just, that's so much power to speaking it out. Mm -hmm. And it's also not a bad thing to think about things. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Like thoughts themselves are not bad thoughts. Like a medical student usually will go into a room before me uh, when I'm working with them to see a patient and they would say, oh, the patient mentioned that they did think about suicide. Mm -hmm. Well, the question is, what did they think about? Did they formulate a plan? Mm -hmm. Did they say the reasons why they're not going through with it? Was this a passing thought? All these things are important because they could be just passing thoughts. Yeah. Thinking about our own mortality could be a normal thing for a yes, person. Yes. And for someone else, it could be a sign of we need to create a crisis management plan. Yes, And I think that sort of nuance is important to bring out. And that's what you're doing with your strategies yeah. when you're working on your play. And I think it's so powerful for those people to come across other people that are like, yeah, I've had those thoughts. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, with, when life gets hard and you're just like, oh, what is, how long is this going to take? <laughs> You know, it's just like, and to, for that person who doesn't have a but it's just a fleeting thought. What a gift to them to hear yeah. that. They're not crazy. How bad is it to feel, oh, I've had this thought of, is the world better off without me? Now that I thought that, that means I'm really going into, and now it's it's a cycle and you're falling down into a really dark place. Yeah. When if you took your strategy of, oh no, I'm exploring yeah. options. I'm a human. Like, I think what does that mean about me? Who am I to think that? And exactly. It's like, well, you know. It let's becomes just, judgmental. Let's be, yeah, let's become an observer rather than kind of a the judge the judger. Isn't it ironic in a society where it looks like media really hems up that we're all judgmental of each other? We're probably yeah. most judgmental of ourselves. Oh, one hundred percent. It's the same thing of like speaking out of pain. Mm -hmm. You know, like we uh, we so someone <laughs> this is like I've worked with. Um, well, I won't say that, but like when people are so awful sometimes. 
and you're, <laughs> and you're just and you're just like there is a part of me that what like where does that come from yeah i mean you pain. must pain and you must really not like that yourself that you're working out of this space how do you not use that that's not the term i want to ask how do you reconcile mm. that someone could be acting very mean very badly towards you or others yeah and you see that they have pain and that's why they're doing that. Yeah. Do you excuse them for their actions? Um, that's a tough question. Cause I would love, as I older I get, I would love to have compassion in that situation. Cause what I want to do <laughs> is there was a producer I worked with years ago. who's just a douche. And <laughs> I, I wanted so bad to go up to them and just go, Hey man, we're all going to die. And your legacy is that you were a douche. And that's a bummer. Yeah. That's a bummer. That's your legacy. That's a bummer. What I want to do is to maybe be a person that, um, oh, you know what actually is a great example of this, not to self-promote, but when I did Forky on Toy Story, um, <laughs> there was a character in that movie, which I, it is one of the most powerful messages I think in, I've seen in these animated movies, but there was a character named Gabby Gabby, and she was like this dark, evil doll in this antique store. And she was, quote, the villain of the movie. And Christina Hendricks voiced her just so well. And Forky, I played a character who was new to this world. He had no understanding. He thought he was came here to help people eat chili and go to the trash. That's it. He doesn't even know why he's alive. <laughs> and so he has just a ton of questions. And he's kind of an open book. And he's like, you know, what's going on? And he meets this evil antique doll. And everybody else is kind of like, ooh, Gabby Gabby. But Forky's just like, I think, I think she's got really pretty hair. <laughs> and so he just kind of starts brushing her hair and kind of, He's a little freaked out, maybe a little bit somewhere, but at most part, he just kind of starts asking her questions, like, you know, and hearing about her life. And they developed this friendship. Come to find out, she was left by a little girl and wants to find another little little kid to, to pick her up. And you learn about her trauma because mm -hmm. Forky didn't label her. Forky didn't come in and judge her. Forky didn't know to do that. And then she has restoration in the end. And I think that's probably... In our society, we do not allow for people to have restoration many times mm. because it all comes from pain. And I, w I would love to, <laughs> sounds cheesy, but I would love to be a forky to someone rather than be like, hey, dude, your legacy is that you're a douche. <laughs> but rather than be like, okay, maybe I'll show some love even though they're giving out something different. That's yeah. a, it's hard. It's really hard. Yeah. And I think the term toxic masculinity uh, yeah, yeah. comes up here. I also yeah. feel currently we're probably misusing the term and using it as a catch-all for every negative thing uh -huh. that happens. Maybe even using it in terms of things that could be positive. But when men traditionally act out, a lot of times it's coming as a result of depressive symptoms mm. or major depressive disorder full on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because what we've come to realize is how we traditionally studied depression was not accurate. Initially, we thought it was a... a an illness that predominantly affected women, which is totally untrue. Yeah. And all the symptoms that we attributed to it were described by female patients. Mm. Just like how our definition of symptoms of a heart attack come from predominantly white men. Mm. So women are misdiagnosed with heart attacks all the time because they don't have the same symptoms as men. Wow. They have slightly different symptoms. So with depression, men experience it differently because they tend to act out. Mm. They tend to start abusing their partners. They mm. tend to start abusing substances, gambling heavily, over uh, perf overthinking about performance yeah, at work. Yeah. And what we fail to realize is that asshole at our job probably is struggling the most and needs the most yeah. help. But at the same time, I don't know how to solve that situation, not as a doctor, but as a person yeah. in that community. Because if you're being affected by this asshole- yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you, what do you turn the other cheek and say, oh, I know you're struggling uh, when I'm struggling myself? Yeah, and it's um, n not to sound super spiritual, but I there have been people like that in my life that I genuinely walk into and I go, I do not, I so dislike this person that I don't know how. And I, I've i surrendered it up to God. Like I, I do, I think there's a lot of power in saying I can't, I don't, I need you to give me this. And it is wild how the heart will turn, I think, in that surrender. You've had experiences yeah. where you, you've had 
a yes. prototypical asshole that you approached yeah. with not that, pr- not that producer, <laughs> which I wish I did. But there have been other people that it, it, God talks. There's a, again, I'm sounding very spiritual, but there's a, there's a scripture that says, I will give you eyes to see and ears to hear. Hmm. And there have been situations in my life where someone has driven me so crazy and I've asked God, I'm like, I don't know, I cannot do this. And I surrender this up to you. And he, there's a new eyes and a new ears for that person. Wow. Yeah. So, and, I, and it's like, I, 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 and I, I can't explain it, but it's just one of those things. And that, that's not an overnight thing. It's not like an, a miraculous, like, but over time, there's, you see, you see doors to pain. You see doors to, or like, you'll see a rant, I'll, I'll see a random act that they did that's, that's contrary to maybe how people see them or something like that. Well, that all comes back to probably your learnings within CBT, that yeah. labeling folks is something we do that actually totally. ends up harming us. Totally. Um, because no one person is all asshole or all good or all bad. Yes. You know, even yes. people that have committed atrocious crimes may be great to their pets yeah. or their family members. And uh, there's a lot of power in finding out someone's history mm. because I recently... Um, I met this person, it was at someone's birthday party and they kind of like rubbed me the wrong way. I was like, oh, that's interesting. And I talked to my friend about it. I was like, that was interesting. And then she told me about their history, new eyes. Wow. Just new eyes on their situation. Um, That was not the situation I was talking about, but it does give you new eyes when you hear about their home life, just like how they were just like raised by wool. I mean, it just was rough. Of and course. it's like, well, of course they're going to act like that. Wow, you have like a, an elevated form of gossip <laughs> where you're not talking badly about others behind no, their I backs. Have. You're giving sort of You're saying a highlight reel today. <laughs> I was going to say, because this is, this is really powerful stuff. Most people are like, oh, douchebag. You're like, douchebag, but. <laughs> well, there have been many, dude. There's I can off the top of my head be like, mm, that's that would take a lot of supernatural power sure. to love that. Well, look, the the reality uh, of that statement, uh, the accuracy of the statement that if you ask God for, and I'm not even spiritual yeah, saying yeah. this, that if you ask God for patience, they give you a crying child that <laughs> refuses to stop crying, right? Or whatever difficult moment totally. that requires patience. Totally. I'm very curious because I've always, I'm always fascinated because you guys, I, I do think a hospital is one of the most spiritual places. Interesting. Because it's a portal out of death and it's a portal into life. Mm-hmm. And um, what you guys face with is so raw. And it's also so, because we as a society, you know, like miracles, for instance, are like, oh, that's that sounds too supernatural. But a woman giving birth is wild. <laughs> it's wild. Yeah, I've delivered 30 plus babies. Dude, <laughs> that is wild. Wild. <laughs> and it's like someone dying and leaving. I mean, it's so wild. And I'm I'm curious how, as a non-spiritual person, I'm to me, that's fascinating. Like how you kind of look at that. I'm hyper practical. Yeah, sure. So I'm strictly what's concrete, what's in front of me, solving the next yeah, issue. Yeah, um yeah. and I think that's how most people end up dealing with it. Yeah, sure. Which I get. I mean, that's life too. Of like, this yeah. is so crazy. We just got to keep going because it's so. It's like one foot in front of the yeah, other sure. aspect, especially in your training, where maybe you have people that are mean to you. And traditionally, in medical education, it's been kind of like a hazing, bullying oh, environment. Interesting. Interesting. Where, like, it, when you would go on your surgical rotation as a med student, there's a process called pimping, where they give you impossible questions and berate you when you don't know the answers. Like uh, you'll be in a general surgery rotation and the surgeon will say, what's the rarest form of pancreatitis or a cause, rare cause of pancreatitis? Mm. And it's like scorpion sting. But unless you read the book inside mm. and out, memorized facts that are utterly useless yeah. for the majority of your life as a yeah, physician, yeah, yeah. Um, you get wrong and then you get laughed at. Because I'll tell you what people need more of is shame. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not to give like, shame. You mean to experience? It. No, it's just like that's the last thing an an, an aspiring oh, okay. doctor needs. Yeah. is more. Sh- I mean, our shame closet is full. That's why I'm always fascinated. Since you brought up hazing, that the whole fraternity sorority system happens at the freshman year in college when yeah. you're your most vulnerable, most freaked out. Oh well, let's put 
like more fear and shame in them. Yeah. It's like they that's the time they need nurturing and guidance, you know? It's funny because whenever uh, I read articles about something terrible happening with hazing, yeah. you see the fraternities and sororities say, well, you know, the fact that I went through this difficult process means that this is worthwhile to me. And this is where I derive the value of being a part of this member group. And I'm like, there's no other way they can make this hard other than hazing. <laughs> I do. It's it's wild. It's it really is a wild time to be doing that. I think for us because it's your first time out of your house with your family. Yeah, you know. Anyways, no, it's it's terrible. And uh, I'm reading a great Let's book right now. Take it down now. today. <laughs> Let's solve it because I'm reading a great book right now. I think it's called Do Hard Things, and they talk about how in collegiate sports, which I know you're not a fan of, no. even though you grew up in the South where yeah. everyone was. <laughs> yes, um, yes. Yes. They push. I enjoy this. watching them. I think it's fun to watch. <laughs> okay, fair. You know, hit each other. That's cool. I think it's fun. I like a tailgate. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. Hanging out with friends. Yeah. Um, the way that we instilled in our coaches to toughen everyone yeah, up, yeah, yeah. not give them water, work harder until they break down is the way to develop talent. And they got that from watching Navy SEAL tryouts. Wow. But Navy SEAL tryouts are not meant to nurture and develop talent. No. They're meant to weed out the elite people who are can survive these yes. ridiculous moments, and then they begin the nurture process for them. Wow. So that's where the coaches have gotten it wrong. I do, and, and it's amazing, like the, the movies or the stories you hear where you have more of a nurturing coach, everybody is like, oh, you see the power in that. Yes. Man, that's good. But that's not high, like it's highlighted in Disney movies. But it not is. enough. What's the name of the book? Uh, Do Hard Things. I think I have it here in my audio. Because that's an, it's interesting you say that because when we were raising our daughter, um, we were always, it actually, we always tried to, rather than saying, um, you're so good at this, you're so good at this, you're so good at this, um, this a lot of this is probably paranoia par parenting, but we say you do hard things really well. Wow. Because it was, there was something we had heard, and I think it's true of like, if you say, oh, you're you're such a good, that you're so good at this, it's almost like there's a pressure of, mm. I have to maintain Continue. that, or yeah. whatever label I'm given, or I have to maintain that, rather than just in general handling hard life, you know? Sure. The reality, and this is going to come off maybe antithetical to how you've been raising your children, I it feel like matter. we put a lot of oh. effort in trying to get it right. Yeah. yeah and yeah. the reality is science doesn't know. Yeah. <laughs> totally. We know certain things are bad. Sure. We know that if your children experience horrendous traumas over and over again, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. going to be adverse events throughout the rest of their life, yeah, physically, yeah. mentally, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but we don't know what are the correct things to say to the correct child at the correct time. Totally. So I see the effects that a lot of these parental books and yeah, parental yeah, videos yeah. have on my patients who are parents yeah. and how they think that they need to do this thing. And if they don't do it at this trimester or this. Yeah, if, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I'm like, I promise yeah. you don't need to feed your child. If you feed your child every six hours instead of four yeah. hours, a few nights in a row, it's going to be great. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's all going to be great. Yeah. <laughs> And by the way, what a gift you're giving them because there is so much fear-based thinking in oh, raising yeah. children. Like it is, it is constant of like, if I do this, this, and it's, A, it's giving us way too much power. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because like, you're right. Like they're, they're going, it's the, even, even having a child. I remember before we had our, our daughter, somebody took us through Babies Are Us, that story. I was like, okay, you need this, this, and this, and this. I had a panic attack when I left. Cause I was like, why there are people drop baby. I mean, like this has been happening yeah. for generations. Yeah. Do I need 50 things, you know, and we don't, it's all, it's a lot of it's fear based. Yeah. I mean, media marketing. Yeah. Oh, that's why, you know, all these miracle cure products, they prey on your insecurities and fears. You're going to have people show up your door from like the, the baby industry. And be oh, like, they, just they take this they guy basically down. basically do. They're like, oh, he doesn't understand. Like this is baby Einstein or whatever. Yes, 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 yes. And it's like, I still have yet to see the next Einstein and baby Einstein's been out for a long time. So I don't know. You watched it. <laughs> it was, and they're making, they literally will like place a pencil on a table <laughs> and then they take the pencil and then they put a ball and my, this is my daughter just transfixed. I'm like, that's all they're doing and making billions. Yes. 
It, it's great because I, I grew up uh, in Brooklyn uh, as an immigrant coming from Russia mm. when I was six years old, living on welfare. Wow. And the things that I was doing was not educational. It was not smart. It was not safe. Uh, my my dad was going through medical school a second time wow. in a new language. Wow. My mom was trying to provide for my family. And I became a doctor that is very functional and helpful to humans. So like the idea of that you need to take a specific route for success yeah, yeah, yeah. is a little bit, like you said, giving us a little bit too much credit and power yeah. probably. Can I, do you mind me asking a question? Please. Do you, I'm just curious, when it comes to your mom mm -hmm. passing, how do you, it's been five years, you said. It's been longer, 12. 12. Is it, um, how, in terms of, I'm asking this because um, when my wife's brother died, mm -hmm. and and I've had friends that there's a lot of comfort in spiritually for us to see them again. Mm -hmm. Do you come from a space of you think you'll ever see her again? No, mm. I was not raised with religion. Mm. Um, my father is Jewish. Mother was. Russian Catholic, mm -hmm. neither of them practiced. Mm. Um, specifically, my father never practiced because in Russia there was a tremendous sense of anti-Semitism. Of course. I mean, the church has done horrendous things in God's I name. I mean, in all, religion in, in yeah, general has yes, created yes, yes. some great moments and some Ironically, Jesus' teaching is like love, joy, peace, faith. <laughs> the exact opposite of what he was teaching, but go ahead. Well, that's humans trying to do yes, the thing exactly. and we're yes, imperfect. Yes, yes, so. yes. It's like the same thing with raising children, right? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. You can give all the great instructions you want. That doesn't mean uh, that they're totally. all going to get followed. Totally. I just <laughs> think it's, um, I, I, I really think that's, I wouldn't say admirable. It is admirable. It's almost like when I meet an atheist, mm -hmm. for instance, I have a lot of respect because I think it takes a lot of faith to be an atheist. Oh, interesting. You know, I think waking up, and, and I, this is not, I don't come from the place. I, I genuinely mean this Yeah. waking up and living your life as though it is nothing is out there. I think that's, I'm just, I'm on awe of it. And I think it takes a lot of faith to do that. You know, I completely get what you're saying. Yeah. And it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and like day, day to day, I don't think about it, but I could see how, and I see it in my patients who have religion or spirituality, sure, sure, sure. how much weight comes off their shoulders when they know that there's something bigger than mm, them out yeah. there. And I've envied the feelings sure. that they have and the peace that they get from these certain things and sure. the community that they have around sure. them. So I see all the positives. Yeah. And like a true doctor, I see the pros and cons of everything. Of course, <laughs> so. of course. Which is like, yeah, I and a lot of people don't take the opportunity to look at the pros and cons, because I think even in faith, mm -hmm. if you don't have times of questioning, if you don't have times of looking at this, you're, you're doing yourself a disservice. Yeah. You know, because it's, it's not facing things honestly. That's true. You know? And when we're facing issues that affect our mental health, mm -hmm. we start seeing yeah. how that starts translating into our physical health. I know you've been uh, very vocal about your support for those suffering with asthma. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, tell me about that. Yeah, so I, I've had asthma since as long as I can remember. And um, I mean, you've worked with asthma patients so much and it's, it's so terrifying. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, gotten, it's gotten so much better. But when I was a kid, I was in and out of the hospital and all of a sudden you're breathing through a straw. You feel like your life source is being taken away from you. It's horrendous feeling. And it's also that feeling of like, does anybody else, <laughs> does it? Do you, you realize what's happening? I can't breathe. I mean, it's terrifying. Did your friends judge you when you were experiencing attacks? Because uh, I've heard patients describe that. I think, I, don't, I wouldn't say judge. I would say you were put into a category mm. of... Less than. Tony's, yeah, Tony's sits off at the side because he's got asthma or like maybe kind of, that's, I think a lot of the stereotype of like nerd holding the inhaler came from. It's like the weakling with the asthma that was, there was an association there, which is frustrating because, you know, there's many athletes who have asthma and all that kind Very of stuff. Very true. Um, but all that to say, I, yeah, I started working with AstraZeneca about, because there's a, this campaign that we've been doing called asthma behaving badly and dealing with eosinophilic asthma. Mm -hmm. 
which you can get a blood test to see if you have a larger number of eosinophils that can be affecting your asthma. And these were things that I never had as a kid. And also my thing is what I so appreciate about what they're doing, like anything, is just when they, the more they speak about it, when asthma patients feel seen. Because as it, when I was growing up with asthma, it really was like, is anybody else, what the hell is happening to my body? And I, and oh, wh- this is why Goonies is by far one of my favorite movies because the lead character had an asthmatic inhaler. Mm. And I remember seeing him and being like, oh, I had never seen, I was just like, he's got asthma. I've got asthma. And he's like, a, he's like, a, he's like a kid my age and he's the lead of this movie and holy shit. Like it was, I never saw that because you feel seen. And so like this campaign, just making people feel more seen about it. Yeah. It's tough because we A, don't see that. B, we don't hear enough of the Olympic athletes that are crushing it, despite the fact that they have, yeah. uh, or with the fact that they have exercise-induced asthma. Yeah, sure. When I have patients come in that have exercise-induced asthma, they think I'm going to tell them to stop exercising when it's the exact opposite yes. feedback that I oftentimes give them. Yeah. Um, and when it comes to eosinophilic um, predominant asthma, we have to make sure that we as doctors are thinking about that. Sure. Because in severe cases of asthma, this is could be a reason why it's happening and there's treatment options available. Yeah, and I'd never even heard of yeah. it. <laughs> You know, um, so just like that, and the blood test is available and all that stuff. So it's, it's, it's exciting, much like what you're doing, because clearly I'm a doctor. No, I'm not a doctor, but <laughs> like it's, I don't know when you when I resonate with it, and I meet an asthma patient. It's like we're in the same tribe. Did you, when you were younger, did you have a, the emergency inhaler and a controller inhaler that you would take daily? I mainly just had the albuterol, the emergency mm-hmm. inhaler. Okay. And then, um, and then when I would have to go to the hospital, I would they would do a treatment, the breathing treatment. Yeah, because what I find is, in a lot of my patients who have been diagnosed with asthma, they've been somewhat mismanaged. Mm. In that, there's ways to prevent asthma attacks by taking certain medications. Totally. And the last thing I want people to do, because with asthma, we want to decrease hospitalizations, we want to mm. decrease the need to get intubated, mm. because those are the worst types of. Uh, situations for asthmatic patients. And I don't know how you feel about that. I feel like if I had asthma, that would be my biggest fear as a child, especially. Oh, it's a huge fear. But what you said is so powerful because it, it's so individual. Mm. Like it's like working with a doctor to get a treatment plan for yourself. Yeah. Because I mean, uh, there's that, it's so easy to just do kind of a blanket equation for yeah. everything. There's just no blanket equation for each person. Yeah, there's, it, there has to be an asthma treatment plan, step up plan, yeah. what ifs. Do you have a, a good relationship with a primary care doctor? I do, I do. The old, I will say the older I've gotten, my asthma is really in, in a good space. Which happens. Which Oh, it does happen. Yeah. Because yeah. I've heard it kind of also adult, adult onset. My brother has adult onset. Yes, asthma. there is adult onset. The ones that you develop as a child, sometimes you can grow out of. Yeah. Because I've also, like, a lot of mine was allergy induced. Mm. And so, and, and so you had eczema as well. Yeah, I had eczema as well. No I, I love talking to a doctor <laughs> who sees me. Yes. I had the eczema. I had my poor brother, we'd be in a room and all he would hear is just like, <laughs> me just scratching under my, me, they put socks on my hands, all this kind oh. of stuff. But it was uh, eczema and then the nose. Um, I forget what I was saying. Oh, but, but the allergies, mm-hmm. working with an allergist to get um, allergy shots and stuff made okay. a difference. And did you find what your triggers were? Yeah, my triggers are definitely, um, they were these things and then that's gotten better, but a lot of cat, dog. Mm. Uh, and also my parents, they were, we would always have dogs and not hypoallergenic dogs. <laughs> and then one would die and I'd be like, oh, I can breathe. And they're like, we got a new dog. And I was like, do my parents <laughs> want me to die? Um, <laughs> they were trying to train you out of the allergy. It was, was like, like tough love. At least they didn't get cats. But that and then dust and kind okay. of the spring allergies and stuff. You know, some people even have a cockroach allergy. I've heard this. Yeah. And that's like a common thing we test Mold for. was a big one too yeah, for me. For sure. Because that's uh, a lot of times you could tell those things without doing testing just by getting a good history of finding out mm. during which times of year, especially in an area like New York where you have four seasons. Yeah. So if you're like indoors a lot and you're getting allergies, well, that kind of makes sense versus, yeah. oh, it's pollen time, springtime. That's the only time I get these symptoms or whether it's yeah. allergy or asthma related. Totally. 
they getting like, do we need to get this vent system? Do we like, what, what should we move here? Like, and, but it's also, again, it's sometimes it's a crap shoot. You gotta like, and that's why those, I think those testings are pretty great. Yeah. They're really cool. Yeah. Um, all right. So that's cool that you have a good relationship. Is there anything you do, um, with your health that you think is unique? Like, do you follow a certain ritual? Do you take some sort of supplement that is unusual? Uh, I did get into um, a, a, a lot of. Uh, I know you're not a fan of um, no, but how, there, how, there's some things that the could be good. Chinese herbs. Okay, what really, about them? Which they, ones? I think, um, like the homeopathy and stuff. Mm. And it was in addition because I to the it's for me it's the partnership of the natural and well medicine is natural but it's <laughs> <laughs> the kind of homeopathy and modern medicine. Okay, what really worked for me. Um, Cause it was just for me, modern, medicine, but like combining the two was a big, big help for mm -hmm. me. And also kind of for me, like finding out what those allergies were of what like food, sometimes food stuff mm -hmm. made a big difference. So like me. lifestyle factors yeah. were a big one for you. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, Sam, should we do our lightning round? Yes. Okay. We have a lightning Is round. Is that a battery on the back of your? Yeah. Does that... <laughs> Oh, I, I'm not. I'm I not, needed it. it come, I'm not like giving a, you shame. You don't need any more shame in your closet. Dave. <laughs> There's a lot of shame. Does um, that wait? Do you attach that like a magnet? And it, it's a magnet. Yeah. <gasps> okay. <laughs> Is that in a swag bag that I'm gonna get when I'm leaving? <laughs> Actually, I got this in a swag Just bag kidding. from Nat Geo. No. Last week, yeah. Dude, see that attaches to your phone. Yeah, and Dan has one too. Oh, that's nice. He was telling me to get it. I was like, oh, but look, Nat Geo is on top. Sorry, My we thing don't have is the you budget. Can't of... a, you can't have a case though, can yeah. you? And I've never had a case. Oh, you're not a word to drop it. No. Okay. Um, I, I'm worried. There's a confidence I'm working with here. <laughs> I'm very impressed by it. <laughs> you know what? It's what in medicine, when you see so much, yeah. you kind of stop worrying. Dude. Because you're like, oh, man. I, you, you, but then it becomes problematic and you turn into time. my dad who then like I would come to him like, dad, this hurts. I don't care. You're fine. <laughs> totally. That's the Russian father mentality. Totally, totally, totally. That's a gift. <clears throat> okay, here we go. I can tell you every scenario that's about to happen. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. So that's a talent on a talent. Nah, that's all right. No, because every one of those situations comes with pros yeah. and cons. The challenge, this is something interesting that I think one of the challenges because when it, anxiety does live in the what if, mm -hmm. obviously a lot, and you create the scenarios, the double whammy is being an artist where your creative imagination is heightened. So yes. I, when I have been your character, I have to envision a history of that character and as though I was in that history. So my what ifs can be very realistic. Yeah. You know? I, I actually wanted to point this out earlier. The artist's mind is actually really interesting. So messed up. <laughs> yes, but in a way that like, is unique and cool to me as a scientist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you have to create something that's not there. Yeah. And what medical condition, psychiatrically speaking, do you think creates something that's not there? Hallucination. Yeah, schizophrenia. Yeah, yeah Typically yeah, yeah. speaking. So there is a, a there's a an existence there where artists have higher rates of schizophrenia, hmm. and we realize that the border between creating well, something now that's I have something not else real. to worry about when I lived. <laughs> no, this is <laughs> kidding. you're supposed to be. Come with this information. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, but yeah, like that's, that's so interesting wow. that how it works. Yeah, it really, really breaks my heart. This is a random thing, but uh, homelessness mm -hmm. is there is so much schizophrenia of on the streets, and it's just, oh, it breaks my heart so much. Our mental health care system sucks. Yeah. I'll be the first to admit it. Yeah. So on that side note, um, <laughs> more shame. Number one. <laughs> Oh, oh, this is the lightning round. This is the lightning round. This, this is going to be fun. Are those bees on the bottom of your shoe? Oh, I don't know. They are bees. Because this is like a hive on the side of your shoe, and those yes. are bees. I love bees. I'll notice the specifics. <laughs> <laughs> Go bees. <laughs> well, I remember you had a character on your Oh, Netflix yeah, I did, a, I did a children's book called Archibald's Next yeah. Big Thing, and it talks about being present. And this little character, Archibald, Baby. gets a gets a card in the mail that says... Um, uh, your big thing is here. And he's like, where? And he goes on all these adventures. But every time he's on an adventure, he's like, I got to just, I got to get to the next big thing. And this bee comes along. And it's like, got to just be, man. You got to just be. And then he realizes the card is right. Your big thing is here. My big thing is talking to you right now. That's wow. my big thing. <laughs> Made me a little emotional. Good. Thank you. Let's get, let's get him crying. <sighs> okay. What's one thing your body does that not everybody else's body does? 
<laughs> what does my body do that not everybody's body does? Probably worry about how I'm sounding anytime I'm talking. Okay, so you have an editor. I have an editor because when my, um, with asthma, my voice as an actor mm. will be back here. Mm. And like, for instance, when I did Forky, he's up here, he's a little more in the nose, but my everyday voice tends to be here. And because it's always a challenge to bring it up front. Wow. And okay. so I'll always be thinking, and I, a lot of it had to do with this douchebag actor teacher was like, you got no resonance. And it's just stuck with me because words are powerful, guys. Words are powerful. Well, that's post-traumatic growth. You're thinking about it. Thank you. (laughs) What's one thing you would do if I, as a doctor, could guarantee you wouldn't suffer any medical consequences? I would like to stand on a cliff without any fear. And no support. And no support. Wow. Yeah. Because heights are... I'm always impressed that someone can just like do that. And I'm just like, it's just terrifying to me. I yeah. agree. I have the same fear, so I can relate. Um, have you ever almost died? Did I almost die? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Cut to this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I leave here. You know, we were doing a podcast and I asked the question and then you almost died. How would your administration on Veep handle the COVID-19 pandemic? Oh my God. (laughs) By far, Selena would have herself vaccinated and not tell anybody about it. (laughs) That's very true. Yeah. And she would have every booster. Every booster. Before there was even the first one. (laughs) She would get it on the deal. And not tell a soul. Okay, fair. Yeah. Um, Not even her daughter. (laughs) She wouldn't even give it to her. Not even Gary. (laughs) What do you mean? You'd administer it probably. That's true. I would administer it, but there would only be enough for her. True. Which one of the characters you've played would live the longest life? Um, I would say, I would say Archibald, that cartoon, because he, positivity. he sees the best in everyone and the best in every situation. I think that brings a lot of health to your life. Truth. Do you have a guilty pleasure that you spend too much money on? Um... Uh, okay. Well, I, my, I, I would say my guilty pleasure is I like a cruise ship. <laughs> <laughs> like you want to purchase a cruise ship? No, I like cruises. Going on cruises. Be, just because it feels free. Okay. And it's like a floating all you can eat buffet. To well, me. that's hilarious. Cause it's like the opposite of free. It's almost like a floating jail. Cause you can't get off of it. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I love being near the water, but I don't go on cruises much, okay. but I'd love the idea. What I spend a lot of money on. I would say um, it's a weird like it's a weird imbalance of food, and then if we're buying something that's like the same amount, I'm like I get ang- I'm like oh do we do we need to buy that? when in actuality that food is going to go right through my system, and Fair. then this thing we're going to have for five years. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So food. so that imbalance is odd. Fair. Okay. Yeah. We did it. We did it, man. Check out this video of me and Sebastian Maniscalco playing Heads Up. If you think he's funny on stage, he's even funnier on YouTube. Click here to check that out. As always, stay happy and healthy.